If you've been watching my channel for a while, you might remember this clip from my Game Talk Summer Nightmare video. I, to me, personally, I find it hard to get into a new anime, and it's the same with, um, you know, visual novels. Turns out there are a couple of visual novels that I do like, and those two being Doki Doki Literature Club and Song of Sire. Now, you're probably wondering why I bring up these two novels. Well, it's because on the 13th of August last year, Song of Sire came to Steam. So it made me ask myself, which novel do I prefer? Doki Doki Literature Club or Song of Sire? And also, it made me ask myself, what makes a good horror game? Well, sit back, grab yourself some food that might be human flesh in disguise, and get your fourth wall breaking wifey ready as we take a look at both Doki Doki Literature Club and Song of Sire. Also, I'm going to give a massive spoiler warning in this video because obviously I'm going to be looking through the two novels in its entirety, so I'm going to be, reveal be revealing major plot points in the stories and everything, so I highly recommend you check the novel first before watching this video, but if you just want me to talk about all of it and you know what's going to happen, then let us go. You are the star of DDLC. You get to type in whatever your character's name is, which is typical of all visual novels. Our worlds are in danger. And you are invited to take part in a literature club with four girls. Sayori, your best friend since childhood, and she is constantly full of life. <laughs> Natsuki, the typical tsundere who loves manga and anime. Yuri, the quiet girl who is interested in the dark and mysterious. And finally, Monica president of the club who loves to write poems. Apparently you already know her from another club you used to go to together. Throughout the game, you will be writing poems for the club, and you can pick certain words on the poem selection screen to please one of the three girls, but strangely not Monica? As you pick certain words for each character, you start to build a relationship with them, till eventually you come to a point in Sayori's room, where you discover that apparently she has been suffering from depression all her life. Later on in the game, you are given a choice. Sayori confesses her feelings towards you, and you have the choice to either accept it or refuse. Now, I always accept because I'm not a monster. L look, I want to protect that cinnamon bun, wouldn't you? But unfortunately, it doesn't matter what you choose because this will always be the result. I don't know. I really do not know. I generally open the door. So, so oh, oh my god! It is at this point that the game does a complete turnaround and becomes stranger. The characters start glitching out, backgrounds warping, odd poems and fourth wall breaking moments, and the other cast of characters killing themselves. It is eventually revealed to be Monica's doing. I mean, to be fair, we weren't really given a choice to a romancer, and I think that was the best decision. Monica takes you to this place, and all you could do here is just chat with her. Nothing else. But there is a way. If you access the local files of the game and go into the character files, you can actually delete Monica's file. And as soon as you do this, she soon disappears and calls you a monster for doing this to her. Hey, look, if you hurt my cinnamon bun, there will be some consequences. However, she soon forgives you and restores everything. Now, it's at this point that the ending can be different, depending on whether you spend time with all the girls or just one. But regardless, the game ends with either Monica or Sayori deleting the remaining files, and you get a letter from either Monica saying how the club was a bad mistake, which is the bad ending, or a letter from the game's director, Dan Savalto, which is the good ending. In short, DDLC is a very good visual novel that can make the reader feel on edge and can easily surprise a first-time reader with its shocking plot twist. Before I get into Song of Sire, I would like to put a little disclaimer here first. The version I will be looking at is the Steam version. Hey, 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 hey. Wait! Let me explain. I tried looking for the original, but for some reason I couldn't find it. And yes, I could get the DLC, which includes all the cut content, but I want to look at this product as it was presented to me on Steam, since both DDLC and Song of Sire are on Steam. Okay, now that we have that out of the way, let us continue about what the story is of Song of Sire. So, our story begins with... So, uh, the, the, um, uh, the game begins by literally shoving fleshy scary monsters in your face talking gibberish. 
we are introduced to Fuminori, a medical student who is trapped in this nightmarish reality. Apparently after a near fatal accident that killed his family, he was miraculously saved thanks to this experimental brain surgery. Y yeah, good job guys. Apparently this caused his view, taste and smell to change since all he sees is... Yeah, those things. He doesn't tell anybody though because he thinks no one will understand. Then he meets a girl named Saya, and for some reason, she seems perfectly normal to him. Jailbait, in fact! <laughs> Trust me, there's a reason why I say that. The pair become really close, and I mean really close, because she is the only normal human being he can see. Throughout the novel, Saya and Fuminori are trying to figure out where Saya's father is. However, things start to become interesting when a friend called Yo expresses concern for Fuminori and he rudely rejects her. His two other friends, Koji and his girlfriend Omi, start to have their doubts about his weird behavior. Omi goes to check on Fuminori but is unfortunately killed by a mysterious creature that turns out to be Saya. But of course, Fuminori only sees Saya as a little girl. At least that's what she looks like to Fuminori, then oh my god, I do not want to see what she really looks like. Then the novel is pretty much all about looking for Saya's father, whilst also following Fuminori's friends as they try to figure out what happened to Omi and Fuminori's weird behaviour. Later in the novel, we discover that Saya can manipulate the human brain to see the same reality as Fuminori. After a certain incident that involves murder and something else that makes me want to call the police, Fuminori saves Saya from an attacker by beating him to death. She then explains what happened and why. We are given a choice to either return Fuminori to normality or keep his brain as messed up as it is. Of course, the most obvious option is normality. But if you do this, Fuminori is arrested by the police and charged with the murders of Omi and Saya's attacker. He is placed in a jail cell and Saya pretty much leaves him. But wait, there's more. If you pick the other option, the novel continues. Fuminori starts to go insane and he begins to think that his friends are getting in his business. So he plans to kill them off one by one. And that involves another certain incident that we will get to. Oh, trust me, we will. Whilst that certain incident is happening, Fuminori convinces Koji to go with him to see Saya's father's safe house. Koji gets a call from Yo, who is back at Fuminori's, begging for help. Seizing the opportunity, Fuminori pushes Koji into a well, leaving him to freeze to death. Luckily, he is saved by Ryoko, who is not only Fuminori's doctor, but is also investigating Saya's father. We discover that Saya's father has an underground lab where he apparently created Saya and became attached to her. We find out that he died a long time ago, leaving behind a notebook containing info about Saya and her weakness. Koji sneaks into Fuminori's home and finds Omi's remains. We then have the option to call Ryoko or Fuminori. Of course, I picked Ryoko, and together, they decide that Fuminori is too far gone and that they need to kill him, as well as Saya. After figuring out a plan, Koji calls Fuminori to come to an agreement, release Yo in exchange for the whereabouts of Saya's father. They agree to a time and place to meet, and Koji and Ryoko set off. Koji readies his gun, but he is suddenly attacked by what seems like a hideous monster of flesh that actually turns out to be Yo. but Koji kills Yo in a fit of stress and panic. To be honest, it was probably best that Koji didn't know that Yo was this, like, massive creature. I mean, how would you feel if your friend suddenly turned into a massive bolognese monster? Fuminori starts attacking Koji. Koji starts to get the upper hand, but then Saya manages to capture him. But before she could do anything else, Ryoko jumps in and throws a bottle of liquid nitrogen at Saya. Saya screams in pain, which to be honest, sounds her right. And oh boy, trust me, we will get to that. Fuminori flies into a rage, but as he is about to kill Ryoko, she gives him a cheeky smile and fatally shoots Saya. Fuminori, in grief, kills himself by splitting his head open with an axe. Saya, in her dying breath, crawls towards him, but is brutally beaten to death by Koji, who ironically screams at her to not touch his once best friend. Afterwards, Koji is back at home recovering and talking to Ryoko about how they will move on. He says that he still has one bullet left in the gun, as he shockingly reveals that if things get too much for him, that bullet can save me. 
So in short, Song of Sire is a very interesting novel that explores the insanity of Fuminori, as well as figuring out the mystery of who Sire really is. Would I recommend it? Well, yes and no. Trust me, there's a reason why I say that, which we will get to. But in terms of horror, it definitely succeeds in making the player terrified. So, obviously both novels are based in the horror genre, and if you don't get that, then you must have the IQ of a fly that failed primary fly school. The horror genre, according to library Westport Library Libguilds.com, oh boy, that's a mouthful, is a genre of fiction which is intended to, or has the capacity to frighten, scare, disgust, or startle its readers or viewers by including feelings of horror and terror, and it's no big surprise that the horror genre it can be incorporated into all kinds of media, including books, films, and games, etc. However, some people would say that horror is a difficult genre to do well nowadays, because it's all been done before. For example, the psychological horror in Cry of Fear had already been used in Silent Hill. Dead Space's survival horror was seen before but in Resident Evil and loads of other games too. And we pretty much know that the zombie genre has been milked so incredibly hard that the cow is just lying on the floor barely getting enough milk so all you're really getting is his blood that looks like milk but it's unfortunately not and I should probably move on. However, one could argue that it depends on the details of the story or the gameplay that makes each horror product its own. For example, Cry of Fear is interesting to me because it also delves into the personal feelings of Simon, like his anxiety and suicidal depression, Dead Space, you know, takes place in, you know, space, and there are some unique zombie games that come into mind, such as the variety of the special infected in the Left 4 Dead series and the open exploration in Dying Light. What I'm trying to say is that DDLC and Song of Sire are not the first ever visual novels or games to tackle their horror genre, but they do have their own unique quirks that make them stand out. DDLC is classed in the meta and psychological horror category. According to Slideshow.net, psychological horror is a subgenre of horror fiction that relies on characters' fears, guilt, beliefs, eerie sound effects, relevant music, and emotional instability to build tension and further the plot. The meta-horror genre involves films, games, books, and etc. that are self-referencing. According to imb.com, this means they contain details that delve into and explore what makes the genre tick, in an effort to make the audience think more deeply about what the horror genre is. In some cases, the characters are aware of their fictional nature, and they can address the audience directly. This is called breaking the fourth wall. So, how does DDLC use these two subgenres so well? Well, it starts off as a typical novel, but quite near the beginning, after you show your second poem to Monica, she makes an interesting remark. When that happens, don't forget to save your game. She then plays it off as a joke or just a quirky thing to say, but it makes you think, why would she say that in a game where making choices is a core part of the novel? Also, when Sayori dies and that scene comes up, if you look in the background, you will notice a text that says Traceback. This is actually a text document that you can find in the local files. Opening Traceback, well, you will find a text saying, Oh jeez, I didn't break anything, did I? Hold on a sec. I can probably fix this, I think. Actually, you know what? This will probably be a lot easier if I just deleted her. This instills a fear into the player, knowing that something is messing with the game files. Then, when it returns to the title screen, Sayori is not there anymore, and is instead replaced by a messed up picture of Monica. When Act 1 starts again, you will notice that it's all bugged since Sayori is no longer in the game, and the game struggles to function. The character file is no longer there in the game files, as if something accessed your files and deleted her. I should also say that before you discover Sayori's dead body, Monica creepily says, You kinda left her hanging this morning, you know. This makes the reader feel a sense of dread and discomfort, since it is eerily silent in the room, and you know that Sayori has severe depression, so when you find Sayori dead, it gives you this feeling of guilt that you could not save her. Then, as I said previously, after Sayori's death, 
glitches start to happen, such as Natsuki having a realistic mouth. At one point, the background starts becoming tilted. In the second act, if you go to the menu, there is a 2% chance that this picture will flash in a second. There is a rare chance that in the classroom, if you look at the background, there will be a picture of Sayori's suicide and loads of other stuff. During this act, the novel will start talking to you, saying how Natsuki and Yuri are not worth your time, and instead, you should just spend your time with Monica, as the phrase, just Monica, is constantly repeated to you. Act 3 is when DDLC uses Meta Horror to its best. In Act 3, Monica reprograms the game to be just you and her. She often makes interesting comments, such as using your actual username on your computer, stating that she asked you in the game's download page to spend time with her. I'm super excited for you to make friends with everyone and help the literature club become a more intimate place for all my members, but I can tell already that you're a sweetheart. Will you promise to spend the most time with me? If you are recording the game using OBS or XSplit, Monica acknowledges this and after a short dialogue, jump scares the player. Now obviously I could go on and on and on and on about the many different secrets that Doki Doki Literature Club has, but that would take way too long to do. However, I am going to show you two secrets that I really like. If you go to the local files and onto the character files and delete Monica or Sayori before you start Act 1, the game will begin with Sayori expressing extreme distress as if realising that something is wrong. She will yell, PLEASE MAKE IT STOP! The game will then exit itself and if you reopen it, you will be greeted with this. If you wait 10 minutes, a quote will then show saying, Now everyone can be happy. As for the second secret, if you try and copy and paste save files from Act 1 during the second or third act, a black screen will come up saying, Unable to load the save file. Monica will then talk to the player saying, Are you trying to cheat? To me, that's why I love DDLC so much. It knows the definition of psychological and meta horror is, and it goes above and beyond with it. Some people will say it's similar to like Undertale or I'm Scared to, with the way that they interact with the player, but for me personally, I prefer DDLC because it has tons and tons and tons and tons of secrets waiting to be discovered. Oh, and all those glitches that happen throughout the novel, they're all completely random. So through each playthrough, it's something new, so it keeps the replayability. Having said that, I would also say that the plot twist is also the novel's greatest weakness. It takes a long, 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 long time for the game to really, you know, kick off its true nature. But to be honest, I would argue that it's good that it left it that long, so then the shock will hit harder. Song of Sire falls into two subgenres, those being psychological and Lovecraftian horror. Lovecraftian horror, according to Wikipedia, I know, the most trustworthy site ever, is a subgenre of horror fiction that emphasizes the cosmic horror of the unknown, more than gore and other elements of shock. And as you can guess, this definition was based on the work of the famous author H.P. Lovecraft. Now, you must be wondering why I put Song of Sire in the Lovecraftian section. Well, it's because, after doing some research on the novel for the video, I came across a wiki page for Song of Sire, which talks about the origins of Sire, and I found this interesting snippet. It is more hinted that Sire was brought into this dimension by occult means, rather than science, due to the interaction with the character Ryoko. I must have missed this, but perhaps because of the choices that I made? Such as I went with calling Ryoko instead of Fuminori when Koji snuck into Fuminori's home? But to be honest, if I had called Fuminori, that would have meant Sire would have won, and I am not okay with that. Personally, if you were to ask me which subgenre that Song of Sire does better, I would have to say psychological. It is true that the novel is good at using Lovecraftian elements, like the fact that Sire's species is supernatural or alien, and the fact that we don't really know what her true origin is, but I get the feeling that it was going more towards a psychological horror approach. So, how does Song of Sire use psychological horror? 
Well, let's look at Fuminori. He's trapped in this nightmarish reality where all his surroundings and all the people he meets are hideous flesh amalgamations. It would drive anyone to the brink of insanity. Plus, he holds on to Sire like she's his saviour, his one and only, and he would do anything for her, including murdering people so that they can stay together. We slowly see his transformation from a pitiful man to a psychopath who seems perfectly okay to murder those he once called friends. He constantly talks badly about his friends or helpers as if they were just obstacles in his way. A particular example is when he kills Sire's attacker. Even though he knows who this person is and what Sire has done to him, he says that he feels little and all of those deplorable acts including cannibalism and something else, all of those things just to be with Sire forever. In fact, in that section of the novel where Sire gives Fuminori the option to return to normal, if you choose not to, Fuminori gives an example to Sire for his reasoning to stay like this. He tells Sire about a manga he read where, similarly, a man recovers from a car accident and he could no longer see the world as it was. He saw people as rocks and robots, as beautiful women. He later fell in love with something that wasn't remotely human. The man who fell for something inhuman gives up his own humanity for the sake of their love. A happy ending, don't you think? I tried to see if this manga actually existed, but so far I haven't found anything yet. <laughs> but I would say it's a big jump from rocks to flesh and gore. It's also interesting to me that whilst dismembering Sire's attacker, Fuminori explains why he wants to stay like this. Sire starts to question Fuminori with a little bit of fear in her voice, suggesting that Sire is actually scared of what Fuminori has become. And there is a part where she's slightly trying to convince him to like return to normal, saying, I don't want you to regret this. I don't, but it later goes away as she gives in to her selfish desires. This makes sense since Sire is a creature that wants to learn about human biology. Which kind of sucks, because I would love to see if there's an ending where Sire becomes ashamed of Fuminori to, of what he has done. Another thing to pick up on is the side characters and their reaction to Sire, specifically her attacker, Yo, and Koji. The novel describes their utter horror at looking at something so unreal to them that they cannot speak. In fact, this could tie into Lovecraftian horror in that they express cosmic horror of the unknown. I would also argue that the novel has a psychological effect on the player, as throughout the novel, you question yourself, how would you react if you lived in this nightmarish reality, and you met a person who was the only normal looking human being? Would you do anything to be with that person forever? Finally, let's look at the uh, Koji after the events of the novel. Even though he does not clearly show it, we know that he is traumatized by the whole situation, because he does consider taking his own life to stop whatever he is going through. Again, it makes the reader ask themselves, if you had gone through the same traumatizing experience as Koji, how would you move on in life? I imagine that it would be hard to talk to anyone about it because they probably won't believe you. That's the thing that I really like about the novel. It explores the transformation of insanity for a person that's going through hell, and the psychological damage that it can do to a person, whilst also leaving questions with through the audience. Like, what would they do if they were in a similar situation? But, there is one massive downfall that I must address. Now, what I'm about to describe right now is going to trigger a lot of people. So if you don't want to hear it, please skip to this timestamp down below if you don't want to hear it. During the novel, Yo will get a text message from Omi, who is clearly dead, telling her to come to Fuminori's house. Taking her chances, Yo goes to Fuminori's home, only to find Saya waiting for her. Now, the first thing you would think is that she's going to get killed, but nope! Instead, Saya proceeds to rape her, and the novel goes into detail about how she does it. And it gets worse! When Fuminori gets home, he discovers a naked Yo on the floor with a dog collar, as Sire calls her a pet. A pet! For Fuminori to... pleasure himself with. Oh, and I would like to state that she cannot talk or do anything! Fuminori then proceeds to rape her with Sire watching. 
again as the novel goes into heavy detail of how the rape is done. Thank God I had the Steam version so I didn't have to see any more pictures. But seriously, what the hell? This is not a ha-ha situation, this is something that really makes me angry. Now, before you comment away on how this is somehow acceptable because it fits into psychological horror, hold your horses. Yes, rape can be used in a story, if it is done well. Rape is one of the worst things that a human can do or experience, and the fact that the novel handles it so poorly with this scene to almost describe it as like a fetish that I'm sorry, but no, you cannot do that. And the fact that it's in the novel is completely disgusting. In fact, after I read that scene, I had to genuinely take a break because I was so upset with what I just read. That's why I find it hard to recommend this novel, because all of the other stuff is genuinely good, and it is effective in psychological horror, but it falls flat on its face with that scene. In fact, when that scene happened, I lost all of the little respect I had for Saya and Fuminori, which is why I am glad that they died in the fight scene with Koji and Ryoko. You can probably tell that throughout the video, I prefer DDLC to Song of Saya, and you are correct. However, this does not mean that I think Song of Sire is a bad visual novel and that DDLC has no issues. DDLC does have its fair share of issues, like, as I said before, the plot twist does take a long time to reach it. During the second act, so many glitches happen that it kind of loses the scare factor. I don't really like Sundere characters, so you can figure out how I feel about Natsuki. And the novel does make it obvious that Monica is the one who is messing with the game. Compared to Song of Sire, excluding the terrible scene, I didn't find that many issues with the novel. It constantly kept me hooked and managed to make me feel uncomfortable and sorry for the characters. Plus it has a better soundtrack compared to DDLC. Not to say DDLC has bad music, it is good to listen to and some of the themes play well with the characters, but it's not as good compared to Song of Sire's. I suppose people will ask me um, if they should get the original version or the Steam version of Song of Sire. And my answer is that if you can, it depends if you can handle the concerning amount of sex scenes. Anyhow, I feel like I've covered everything that I need to say for all of this video. And I strongly recommend DDLC. And if you are brave enough uh, to tackle Song of Sire, go for it. Anyhow, if you enjoyed this video, why don't you like, comment, favorite, and subscribe to see more content like this, and I'll see you all in the next video. Oh boy, I could go for a human intestines. To me, that's why I love DDLC so much. It knows the definition of psychological and meta horror is, and it goes and beyond. That's why I love DDLC. It goes, it it goes above and beyond with it. Some people will say it's similar to like Undertale or I'm Scared with the way that they interact with the kit, you know, the player, uh, the sanity to a person that is probably going through hell, and also as with that the plot twist is kind of like is the